we will be starting our journey to the discussion of carbohydrates and we start with some of the common definitions. Common because I bet you some other people can give like dozens of different ways to explain or define carbohydrates, but we will use the most popular ones. First, when we discuss carbohydrates probably from preschool or grade school, all we know about them is what they are used for. And remember, when we were taught this before, foods that are rich in carbohydrates are often called go foods. I think a lot of us were taught that. That's because they are often popular as our primary energy source. But of course, that means there are a lot of other uses for carbohydrates that we will reveal as we go on in the future. Now, as far as the structural basis is concerned, we can start off our discussion of carbohydrates by, you know, just you know, casually disintegrating the word carbohydrate into carbo and hydrate, meaning hydrates of carbon. That would give us the idea of this one, carbon, having hydrate, which means water, H2O. And if I put N here, I would get some kind of general formula CnH2NON. This is actually the basic formula for our monosaccharides or the you know, one unit sugars, which the most popular one I think is C6H12O6. That means that most of our monosaccharides have the equal number, as you can see, of carbons and oxygens, and their hydrogens is twice the quantity. Now, when we classify carbohydrates, we really classify them by the number of units or discrete pieces of carbohydrates, and if we have only one discrete unit, we call it a monosaccharide. Well, mono means one in the first place, right? Saccharine is also a word that's synonymous to the word sugar. Take note that whenever we use the word sugar in biochemistry, it's more applicable to the smaller, sweet-tasting uh, carbohydrates, usually monosaccharides or disaccharides. All right? Now, if I have a monosaccharide, and we will go further into its structure later, we can actually further describe it in two ways, by its functional group and by its number of carbons. You have two options for the functional group, aldehyde group or ketone group, both of which, if you recall your organic chemistry, are carbonyl containing. And usually, we end with a suffix OSE for the monosaccharides. That's where popular words like glucose, fructose, galactose, and so on come from. Now, take note that regardless of being an aldehyde or ketone, all of our monosaccharides are described to be polyhydroxylated. Meaning, polyhydroxy, they have a lot of hydroxy groups, or OH groups. By the number of carbons, it's easier to take note of because, for example, I think a lot of us know that the prefix tri means three. So triose is a three-carbon sugar. Tetra. Tetrose is a four-carbon sugar. Penta. Pentose is a five-carbon sugar, and so on. Actually, we have something greater than six carbons. We have actually sugars with seven, eight, nine carbons, but we will not uh, talk about that too much. Okay. Now, if I have more than just one unit, specifically 2 to 10 units, we have what we call oligosaccharides. Oligo literally meaning few. Now, it has been decided by several textbooks, a lot of the popular biochemistry textbooks, that, you know, the qualifying number for oligo or few is 2 to 10. Some textbooks actually use different numbers, but this is what you will read in a lot of references. The most popular of the oligosaccharides are the disaccharides or those that contain two units. And I think it should always be part of my introduction to discuss the three most popular disaccharides. Those are maltose, lactose, and sucrose. Now, what's good in all of them is that all of them have glucose, and so I think the only blue means glucose. And the only thing you need to memorize is the partner sugar for them to be a complete you know, disaccharide. For maltose, glucose is partnered with another molecule of glucose. Lactose has glucose attached with one gal, which means galactose. And sucrose has glucose with, another, with one molecule of fruit, which means fructose. Now, if I have more than 10 monosaccharides linked or connected together, I have what we call a polysaccharide. Poly meaning many. And take note that greater than 10 is actually a deceiving uh, description because sometimes, and actually most of the time, 
polysaccharides are composed of hundreds, thousands, or even tens of thousands of monosaccharides attached together. In fact, we can even subclassify polysaccharides as homoglycans or heteroglycans. From the prefix homo, homoglycans contain only one single sugar. Many, many thousands of the same exact sugar connected together. Heteroglycans, on the other hand, have at least two different sugars. It can be, of course, three or four or more different types of sugars connected together. Popular homoglycans are starch, glycogen, and cellulose, which I think are very, very common words for us as early as high school. And uh, heteroglycans include chondroitin, heparin, and pectin. Now, after this introduction, it's time to introduce you to the structural formulas of carbohydrates. I will start with the linear structures first, followed by the cyclic formulas.